Hello, we're local nations. This is Ali Nassan. I'm here at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine postdoctoral endodontic program. I'm joined uh, with Dr. Uh, Ian Grayson, the uh, postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard uh, Postdoc Endo program. Ian, thank you so much for uh, joining me. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Great to have you here. And Ian has a case uh, for us that we're going to do in this new segment, which is the um, uh, endodontic management of the medically compromised patient. And today's case is uh, just a, um, uh, a pregnant patient, of course, not medically compromised, but uh, requires certain management requirements. And uh, Ian, why don't we listen to the case that you've done first, and then from there, we're going to talk about the, uh, uh, the, the management issues that comes uh, associated with it afterwards. So let's quickly go through the case first. Okay. Our case involves a 28-year-old Caucasian female who presented to our office in pain uh, in the upper right areas. Um, when we reviewed her medical history, um, she was very healthy. She had no serious health concerns. However, she was two months pregnant. On our examination, tooth number four was acutely tender to percussion, had apical tenderness, and there was swelling in the area. The patient had previously been on two courses of amoxicillin to control the inflammation and the swelling, and our diagnosis was an acute apical abscess on a previously treated endodontic procedure. Our treatment plan was to perform an incision and drainage that day using lidocaine, 2%, 1 in 100,000, and that was to prevent any kind of infection and relieve the pain. Uh, after two to three days, we removed the drain and we were going to monitor the patient in conjunction with her obstetrician. Mm -hmm. Our initial um, treatment plan was to reappoint her in the second uh, trimester for apical surgery uh, since this tooth had already been retreated previously. Now we see here on her preoperative x-ray, uh, the root canal is well done. It goes right to the apical area. Uh, however, there's a fairly large radiolucency at the apex of this tooth. And so what we've done is we went in surgically. Uh, we removed approximately three millimeters of the apical area. Um, and we replaced uh, the gutta perca towards the end with BC sealer. And here you can see on the x-ray on the far right, uh, the area has totally been uh, removed and you can see a nice seal placed at the apical area. In terms of a follow-up, uh, virtually immediately after the incision and drainage, the patient's pain disappeared. There was no further requirement for antibiotics, which is always a good thing mm -hmm. because the fewer uh, drugs that you give these patients, the better off you are. The surgery went ahead without incident. The patient healed well. And to add to um, the uh, beneficial result, the patient delivered a healthy girl four months later. That's terrific. So, uh, in this case, kind of um, becomes a great uh, diving board to get into this whole area of how do we manage patients that are pregnant that come in for uh, endodontic therapy or have acute pain or uh, are emergency patients, but they are pregnant, various stages of pregnancy, and they are, uh, you know, we have to consider them. What are some of the broad um, considerations for patients that are pregnant that we have to uh, uh, to, to to kind of manage? That's that, that's a great question because that's probably the single most important factor that you can consider is how do you handle these patients and there's basically four categories of um, information that you have to know or be able to practice when you're dealing with this. The first is the timing of the treatment. When is the best time to perform the treatment that you need? The second type is what kind of procedures can you perform? The thirdly, what kind of pharmacology can you utilize? And then there's the overall physiological considerations that you have to deal with because of that state. And uh, so some of these overall considerations that you need to keep in mind, uh, what, would, what, what are they? The, the overall considerations are the first thing is cardiovascular. The second thing is the respiratory changes that take place gastrointestinal changes as well, and then there's oral changes which are mainly brought on by high levels of estrogen. And, and when you look individually at each category, the first and foremost one is cardiovascular changes. Cardiovascular take, places, um, take place in uh, most women, and generally speaking, there's a 30 to 50% increase in cardiac output. During the second and third trimester, there's a decrease in blood pressure, when the patient is supine. And generally speaking, this can manifest itself in fainting, nausea, and dizziness when the patient is being treated. To prevent this, 
um, we can elevate the right hip. And the reason for doing that would be to facilitate the venous return by reducing pressure on the inferior vena cava. Yeah. The next thing we can look at are respiratory changes. As the fetus develops and enlarges, the diaphragm is pushed up into the thoracic cavity. When that happens, there's an increase in intrathoracic pressure, and this can result in difficulty breathing, inhaling and exhaling when the patient is in the chair, and this also must be taken into account. The third, the third uh, change is gastrointestinal changes. What happens is there's an increase in gastric pressure because of the decreased volume within the abdomen, and this can result in reflux. As a matter of fact, it affects as many as 30 to 50 percent of the women. So in this particular case, in order to deal with, certainly chair position is important. We want to treat these patients in a semi-supine position, not laying flat, in order to make them comfortable. And the last thing we deal with are the oral changes, the oral changes which are brought about by estrogen levels. One of the most important things we see is we see inflammation of the gingival tissues and we can see reactive lesions and the most common reactive lesion that we see is a pyogenic granuloma. Mm. This is often called a pregnancy tumor because it takes place during pregnancy. We also note salivary changes. When we see salivary changes we note a decrease in the amount of saliva produced in these people. High estrogen levels will also predispose the area to gingival inflammation, and they can make pre-existing periodontal conditions far worse. They can also initiate periodontal conditions if they're not properly managed initially. Hmm. However, dental caries is also uh, increased, and this is generally due to a drop in oral pH and an increase in the amount of bacteria that can grow within that environment. So in order to combat this scenario, what we always encourage patients is very, very good oral hygiene. That's meticulous brushing, flossing, and the use of various mouth rinses that can keep the area very, very clean and sanitary. Terrific. So in terms of the uh, pharmacology of medications that are indicated, contraindicated in terms of the management of the patient who's going to have uh, endodontic therapy, what, what are some of the considerations? Well, generally speaking, uh, almost all drugs would be contraindicated. However, some are more contraindicated than others. Now, certain drugs can have profound influences on the fetus because they readily cross the placental membrane. And as a matter of fact, even postpartum, we see that many of these drugs are in fact excreted in breast milk, and that will compound the effects of them. So drugs are generally categorized uh, A through D as the risk increases, and then there's another group, which is a group X, which is totally contraindicated because severe teratogenic effects. Mm -hmm. Now, antibiotics, with in terms of them, most of them will cross the placental membrane and will have an effect on the fetus. So there are certain antibiotics, four to be exact, that can be used during pregnancy with relatively few side effects. That would be penicillin, amoxicillin, clindamycin, and metronidazole. We try to stay away from the broad spectrum tetracycline. It is not to be used because it causes staining in the teeth and in the uh, bone. Yeah, I, I, coming, if you think about it, uh, clearly the uh, for a patient uh, that is, um, for all patients, if you will, that they already have a bio uh, uh, flora, uh, or a biome basically in their GI, taking the antibiotic will change that biome. However, of course, for the pea fetus itself, because the fetus is sterile, doesn't have any bacterial um, uh, kind of, um, there's no flora associated with the fetus, so the, uh, so the antibiotic will not have an effect on the biome itself, however, it will um, basically, you know, things such as tetracyclines that stain the uh, skeleton and the, the tooth, and the, teeth, yes. the teeth, it will have uh, an issue with that. The other uh, group of medications, obviously, that are highly used during the endodontic uh, management of, of a patient is analgesics. So right. what about those? Analgesics are, are used, uh, obviously, for pain control, and the most common analgesic that you can use with very little in the way of consequence is acetaminophen. However, morphine can be used, and one must be careful in terms of using morphine because of respiratory depression, where, as we mentioned previously, there's already difficulty breathing, so you should use it with caution. And meperidine, or Demerol, can also be used. It has less respiratory depression. A Vicodin oxycodone can be used, but certainly with caution. Now, contraindicated are ASA and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. They should definitely not be used, especially in the third trimester, uh, because of the bleeding associated with them. 
and they have also been associated with cardiac septal defects in the mm -hmm. fetus. So they're definitely contraindicated uh, for any kind of pain management on the uh, uh, pregnant patient. Of course. What about local anesthetics? Because that's obviously another area. Yeah, local anesthetics are our bread and butter in dentistry. And essentially, there are two that are certainly okay to use. Uh, that would be lidocaine and prilocaine. Um, but if you can perform a procedure without anesthetic and you're dealing with a non-vital tooth, obviously that's preferable. But if you have to, lidocaine and prilocaine are good choices. Uh, one should shy away from pivocaine and bupivacaine. They should be used with caution because they're known to cause fetal bradycardia, no. which is a slowing of the heart. Yeah, of course. Uh, although I must say that given the safety level of lidocaine uh, with as a constrictor, I think I would probably um, go on the side of making sure that patients are completely comfortable because taking a chance at skipping an anesthetic in order to reduce any potential, not really harmful uh, local anesthetic to be given to a patient during pregnancy can increase on the other side, a patient's anxiety level, you know, all kinds of endogenous, endogenous uh, catecholamines and right? epinephrine that is going to be released. So I, I think it's critical that a patient's completely numb and comfortable during a procedure, uh, especially if they're pregnant, because all kinds of things can, can go wrong if they're not comfortable. And given the, as we talked about it, given, I mean, local Anesthetics such as mepivacaine and um, and even xylocaine with with uh, epinephrine are category A drugs, so they're fairly safe to use. Yes, they are. Uh, by the way, um, you know the other articaine and things like that are category C. Yes. So that's one of uh, the ones that we don't want to use uh, if we can help it on a pregnant patient. So what about sedatives? Because that's also some people give sedatives to patients that are not pregnant. What about for the pregnant patient? Uh, for the pregnant patient, the most common sedative that we use is nitrous oxide. And nitrous oxide is definitely contraindicated in the first trimester because it's been associated with spontaneous abortion. Uh, certainly when you look at barbiturates and benzodiazepines, um, they're also contraindicated uh, because they've been associated with cleft lip and palate. Uh, probably better off not to give those drugs during pregnancy. Right. So the other thing that everybody, all pregnant patients are worried about is radiographs. Obviously, you know, x-rays have a pretty bad reputation. Um, luckily, x-rays have improved with digital technology in terms of the dosage and the rads that a patient gets. But x-rays are critical, you know, for our diagnostics because if you don't have proper information, you can screw up a case. And the question is, you know, what is that happy balance? We just had a conversation with the head of radiology at Harvard, and he said take as many X-rays as needed. Basically, what is what, what do you uh, what do you think? I, I I agree somewhat with that. Certainly, you don't want to take unnecessary X-rays. Um, when you look at the actual dose that the fetus gets, the fetus gets one fifty thousandth the dose that the mother gets in the oral cavity. So we're not talking about large amounts of radiation. Um, I, I think, and I, I totally agree with you, that x-rays are mandatory to make a proper diagnosis. And when you weigh the risk-benefit reward, it's definitely better to take an x-ray and understand exactly the type of pathology that you're dealing with. Now, the greatest risk of x-rays, and if you want to try to avoid x-rays, would come during the first trimester. That's the most rapidly growing area for that fetus. So at that point in time, if you can, avoid it. But most of the other areas during the pregnancy, um, you can go ahead and provide the patient with quality diagnosis by using an x-ray. Yeah, there's no question about that. I think uh, skipping radi important radiographic information just for the fear of uh, fear of X radiation um, is really not warranted, especially in today's world, because you now have columnated uh, X ray sources where the the X ray is almost like a laser beam; it goes right through. There is no scatter. Right. Previously, we had these cone shaped X ray hells, uh, which just spraying X ray all over the room. Now, if you're just a tiny bit off, there is no X ray on your sensor. You know you have a big cone cut. So your x-rays are very uh, columnated and they Precise. don't end up going towards the abdominal area where the, uh, where the baby is, where the fetus is. And I do agree on the first trimester you would like to minimize those, but I think even then the main reason we're doing that, to be honest, is because of medical legal reasons. Be and the reason for that is because there's the highest rate of spontaneous abortions in the first trimester 
and you know nobody wants to get blamed for it. So of you're not. you're basically uh, trying to avoid X-rays. But I think the the overall lesson here is that I think if you need radiographs diagnostically, you should take them because it's far more important to manage the case, get enough information so you can prevent the progression of the disease rather than bury your head in the sand over this unrealistic and irrational fear of radiographs, which could then later on cost the mother and the fetus a lot more in terms of your inability to manage a situation that could have been, um, you know, that could have been prevented from being elevated to a level of, of fascial space inf infection that's traveling all over the place by just taking the proper x-ray at the right time. But, but if you think about it, if you thought to that extent, you wouldn't go out in the sun, you wouldn't travel yeah. in an airplane, you wouldn't expose yourself to all different types. You wouldn't be in a kitchen next to a microwave oven. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it, these are all greater sources of radiation than in fact the radiation that we're using to make a diagnosis. So as you say, it is irrational to yeah. think that way. No doubt about mm -hmm. it. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess it's all about finding a right balance. But the ultimate thing is that diagnosing the disease and treating it properly is the, pri uh, the primary priority of all practitioners. Definitely. So let's talk about the timing. We all know that pregnancy is divided into three trimesters. Right. What about in terms of the indications of treatment at various stages of the pregnancy? Well, generally speaking, in terms of timing, you want to try to avoid any kind of elective procedure in the first trimester and the second half of the third trimester. Um, all the other times, if you have to, you can provide treatment for the patient. Now, the second trimester, as I mentioned, is the slot that you have, the little window you have in pregnancy where you can provide relatively safe treatment. In the third trimester, you want to try to avoid lengthy procedures because the patient gets a lot more uncomfortable because of uh, the, the position that you have to keep the patient in for a long period of time. So that should be provided in a semi-supine position and certainly very, very short. And one should definitely try to avoid the the second half of the third trimester because that's the most uncomfortable time for the mother. Absolutely. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, endodontic infections do not really come with a, with a warning. No. Which is probably why it's a good idea to have a sense of, you know, a, a kind of a tune-up, if you will, prior if somebody's planning on having an, you know, <laughs> planning a, a pregnancy, it's a good idea to go in for a, a checkup. prophylactic make sure, dental appointment. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> to make sure that everything is in order so that there are no uh, problems that could creep up all of a sudden uh, in the middle of the pregnancy that could cause a lot of problems for both the mother and the baby. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, if there is any large decay or carious areas, it could be taken care of in advance so it doesn't become a big uh, problem during the um, um, the problem. So what is, what is your conclusion over the whole thing? It really, in, in, in conclusion, other than routine examination, scaling, and prophylaxis, you should try to, if you can, avoid dental treatment unless, of course, there's an emergency uh, problem there where you can, at certain points, definitely treat the patient. Um, the, the emergency treatment can be read can be rendered, but one has to weigh out the risk-benefit ratio and before you offer the treatment. And certainly if there's a question about this kind of thing, um, the obstetrician can be consulted and, and certainly together with the medical team we can make an informed decision. Um, I, I think that you should not avoid treatment just because the patient is pregnant. However, being careful and prudent about weighing the risks for each procedure is definitely paramount. No, absolutely. I think it's a uh, it's very well put. I think understanding the overall requirements, it's always best to kind of have that information in advance prior to pregnancy. You can avoid problems, but sometimes you don't and things can go wrong. At that point, I think it's important to kind of put the risk benefit into the equation, understand that um, any kind of untreated disease could be a problem, not just for the mother, but also for the fetus but keep the treatment to that which is absolutely required, an emergency treatment, elective treatment should be done prior or after the pregnancy. Um, I think what we talked here today is that there are, uh, there are obviously there's some metabolic and physiological changes that occur in the mother during the pregnancy, not only in terms of the, um, the hormonal changes, but also through the physical pressure of a growing fetus inside the uh, abdominal cavity that, that changes the management style of these patients, even from postural to, to also pharmaco uh, pharm pharmacological as well as treatment uh, modalities that we need to keep in mind. And uh, at the end of the day, 
it's you know making sure that you're not uh, overly afraid of getting proper treatment just because of the fact that you have these uh, considerations but limited to that which is necessary well thank you and for real world i'm ali nese and i was joined by uh, dr ian grayson the postdoctoral fellow at harvard school of Dental medicine postdoctoral endodontic program and we hope you found this information helpful